Today I'm going to talk about how to design a fairly generic oscillator. You see an implementation of an oscillator on the left hand side over here. This is the one we're going to analyze in detail. But you can use it, this approach can be used for many uh, different types of oscillators. This is just one implementation. The small signal representation of the oscillator here is on the right and we will see how we get to that. And this is the schematic we're going to use to analyze what the restrictions should be on the various parts to get oscillation. So let's start with that. So we have our oscillator, small signal oscillator over here. And what we're going to do is we're going to cut up this point over here so that we get two nodes here. We get a U2 on the left and we get a U1 on the right. If you want to have oscillation in a circuit like this, it needs to be that U2 is exactly the same as U1. And what that means is that it's the same in amplitude, but also in phase. Okay? And if you have that, you can get oscillation. Now let's analyze what U2 is. What is the, uh, the voltage on U2? So we go over here and we say U2 is nothing more than Z1 over Z1 plus C2, right? Times the amplification and that is the transconductance GME, which is the transconductance of the transistor, times U1, that gives you a current, times the output impedance of the system, right? That will give you a voltage. And if that voltage is equal to the voltage <coughs> on U1, we indeed have oscillation. So you can work this out where the CC, of course, that's the output impedance of the system, is nothing more than Z1 plus C2 in parallel with C3. And that's what you see over here, okay? So now you have an expression of U2 that is expressed in U1. So now we can say, hey, if U2 equals U1 over here, right, then there will be oscillation. So if you work that out, it's nothing more than dividing left and right by u1 and you get this and then stating that that equals to 1 and that gives you z1 plus c2 plus c3 if you work that out on here is nothing more than minus the transconductance g m e times z1 times c3 so if this holds then there will be oscillation in this circuit and that needs to hold for the real as well as the imaginary values. Okay, so let's now assume that all these Z's can be built up out of a resistor type of network plus an X, a JX type of network, right? So a real value and an imaginary value. If you plug this in to this equation over here, you get R1 plus R2 plus R3 plus J, X1 plus X2 plus X3, equals the transconductance minus times Z1 filled out times C3. Okay, now you can work this equation out into a real and an imaginary part. Okay, if you do that, you get essentially two equations out of it. The real part, which is R1 plus R2 plus R3, is the transconductance times this portion, and the imaginary part, X1 plus X2 plus X3 times this portion over here. Okay, so now if we look carefully at these equations, in order to get oscillatory behavior, it better be that this total number here is positive, because GME is positive, because all the resistors here are positive, right? If you don't have that, you don't get oscillatory behavior. So the first restriction that comes out of this equation is that X1 times X3 needs to be bigger than zero. And also, as a side note, which is not as relevant here for what I would like to show, but it's also very important when you design this, is that x1 times x3 better be bigger than r1 times r3, otherwise this is not positive, right? So that also needs to hold. So the first restriction here is x1 times x3 needs, needs to be bigger than zero. So you have essentially two possibilities now to fill this out. You can have both being bigger than zero, and that's in this case, 
or you can have both smaller than zero because if they are both negative the product is still positive so that, that's also a possibility so let's take a look at when x1 and x3 are both bigger than zero if you then look at the second restriction that means that this whole part because x3 and x1 are both bigger than zero and resistors are always bigger than zero that this whole part is negative because GME is also always bigger than zero so this is all negative what that means is that since these two are positive that x2 better be negative and it needs to be more negative than the sum of these two are positive right otherwise this will not be negative and you won't have oscillation remember both restrictions need to hold if you want to let the circuit oscillate okay so if both x1 and x3 are bigger than zero then x2 needs to be smaller than zero now as a second we can also say x1 and x3 are smaller than zero because then the product is still bigger than zero so that's also something that could hold if you look at that you will see that this piece now is totally negative right times this negative makes this totally positive okay if that's positive since these two are negative it better be that x2 is positive right and it needs to be positive more than the sum of these are negative otherwise it's not gonna oscillate again so the restriction there is that x2 is bigger than zero if x1 and x3 are both smaller than zero the conclusion you can draw from this is that you always have a combination of either two capacitors and an inductor or two inductors and a capacitor okay so if you look at the schematic here there will all, always be x1 and x3 will always be the same type either a capacitor or an inductor and if these two are a capacitor then this one is an inductor and vice versa if this is a capacitor then these two have to be an inductor otherwise these restrictions won't hold and you won't have oscillatory behavior okay okay so now let's look at an implementation and i picked a pulpit oscillator which as you already saw on the first slide looks something like this in its most basic implementation it looks like this how do we get from this to this right because this is where we actually executed the calculations on so let's take a look at this <clears throat> and let, let's take a look at a small signal uh, representation of this uh, circuit and I'm sure most of you are familiar with that that you can translate this into this this is the transistor here which you see here right with all its uh, components in there so there is a, a base capacitor in here right from the base to ground that's CB over here which I neglect but you can take it in it's very easy to do I also neglect the CCB that's the capacitor between the, uh, the collector and the base over here that's there there is a transconductance over here of course as the input resistance and then we have a current here which is the transconductance this is the input uh, impedance of course right R, R pi and this is the transconductance times UBE over here okay so if you look at that and then there's another CC over here a capacitor on the output uh, between collector and ground so that's the transistor and here you see your L2 over here right which is between locked up be between the base over here and the collector over there the CS here is assumed so large that it really doesn't matter you can look at it as a, uh, a short as a short at the oscillatory frequencies we are looking at so this is a short for all intents and purposes okay now if you have this schematic you can essentially go to this schematic quite easily if you look carefully you can see that R1 right which is part of Z1 in our calculations previously is nothing more than the parallel resistance of RC RB and R pi okay and that's what you see here and so Z1 is nothing more than the parallel uh, of C1 and R1 and that's what you see over here okay so Z1 equals now the parallel resistance of R bar, uh, B, R, C and R pi with C1 and if you work that out you get this C2 is nothing more than L2 right that's the only component we have there 
and C3 is nothing more than this C3. You could have added in this one, which is very easy to do, as I stated before. Then you can add CC in there, but usually it doesn't matter. The same on the input side, right? For C1, you could have included CB very easily because this one is a short, so these two are just par in parallel. So that's very easy to include also, okay? I didn't do that here, but it's very easy to do. So now, if we go to the restriction we derived previously to get oscillatory behavior, and we fill out Z1, C2, and C3 in there, you get this, okay? We just fill that out, you get this. Now you can work this out into a imaginary portion and into a real portion over here. And I did that here. It's just reworking this a little bit, some algebra, and you get this equation over here, which is an equation that is always zero, of course. What that means is that this part needs to be zero and this part needs to be zero. Both of them need to be zero in order to get oscillatory behavior. Otherwise, you don't get an oscillator, okay? And I make, made this for reference, I call this f omega. So now we can take a look at the imaginary part of this f omega. If you take the imaginary part, make it zero, work this out. So essentially this piece is equal to zero. You work it out and you get that omega is nothing more than one divided by the square root of L2 times CV, where CV is nothing more than C1, C3 divided by C1 plus C3. So a very simple, compact answer on what the oscillation frequency will be. If you really want to calculate the frequency, obviously you have to divide this by 2 pi, right? This is 2 pi times f oscillatory, and that is this equation. So you can easily calculate the uh, oscillatory frequency. Now let's take a look at the real part. So this real part over here, again, we, we put it to zero. If you work it out, you get a very simple equation that's uh, depicts the ratio between C3 and C1 equals to the transconductance times R1, okay? And to give you an idea, let's take some numbers. Let's plug in some numbers in this. If we say that C1 is 100 C3, <coughs> right, and R1 is about 1 kilo ohms, we get a transconductance of only 0 0.01 milliamps per volt. So with very small uh, transconductance, you already have oscillatory behavior, okay? And this approach can be used for a bunch of different stuff. Eh? Now you can say, okay, I'm going to have an oscillator with two, two inductors, for instance. There's an inductor here, an inductor here, and a capacitor here. And you can go through a very similar calculation and get values for that. Okay? So I think this is a great place to stop. If you like this video, please subscribe and please like. And I'll see you in the next one.